throughout its history. Russia has annexed foreign lands, colonizing indigenous peoples, destroying their national identity, then using the same very nations to seize the new territories and enslave other nations. As we see today in the 21st century, the methods that the Kremlin used almost 500 years ago just do not change. And it does not matter what the state is called, ancient Moscovia, the Russian Empire, the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation, the essence remains the same. Today, just as in the past, other enslaved peoples, the Bashkirs, who have been under the Moscow occupations for almost 500 years, give their lives for the imperial ambitions of the Kremlin, apparently completely forgetting how several centuries ago the Moscovites killed their ancestors and annexed their homelands. And after the annexations, those who survived it were forced to forget the atrocities of the Kremlin. The history was rewritten, cultural heritage destroyed, their very lives repressed. This is simply the total destruction of my fellow tribesmen. My nation is shrinking, and this is war against our people. It just destroys us. For almost 500 years, we have been part of this empire as a so-called colony, but the Bashkirs have been waging wars against this Russia for more than 200 years. The history of this process of conquest in Bashkorkastan dates back to 1552. Of course, there was no full voluntary entry. The entire language and culture of Bashkis are being systematically destroyed. We want to be really independent now, to build our own state. Independence has been long-standing dream of the Bashkir people. I believe that we should undoubtedly be free from Russia, especially in today's realities. We are all waiting for the day X. After the President of the Russian Federation announced mobilization throughout the country, including in the Republic of Bashkotarstan, people began to be massively taken to military registration and enlistment offices to be sent to war with Ukraine. They were taken from everywhere, from homes, from educational institutions, right from the streets. I think that, first of all, this was unexpected for the Bashkir nation. And if you knew how to react to this at the very beginning. And it is difficult for me to say how many people were taken to the front from Bashkortostan during the mobilization period. I think we can confidently say that not even hundreds but thousands were taken because Bashkortostan was one of the first not only to fulfill but also to exceed Moscow's mobilization plan. <laughs> My heart bleeds when I think that my people, my fellow tribesmen, who should study, marry and have children in a happy country and have a normal life, instead they go to this war and get killed. And it turns out that the children who should have been born are just not born at all. Mobilization has definitely influenced people's mood. You can even see this not only in the mood, but also in the actions that people have taken. You have seen that many people simply left the country, including Bashkorts, and many have left. This, in fact, speaks of a real mood. No one wants to send anyone. No mother wants to send just like that. Unfortunately, they are slaves to the regime. Because the number of dead is much higher, I have a lot of messages confirming from the villages. Someone is buried today, someone else yesterday, and someone will be buried tomorrow. So the number of victims is much, much higher than we are told. From open sources provided by the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, the Russian army has already lost more than 140,000 soldiers and officers killed. Most of them are representatives of indigenous peoples from national republics that are currently part of the Russian Federation. Those who were against, who had a clear position, they immediately spoke out against this war and mobilization. I have friends, some of them went to some protests. They were then taken to custody by whole families. 
In Bashkortostan, just as in other regions of Russia, there were protests after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, starting on February the 24th, most often with single pickets, after which people were detained. Administrative reports were drawn up against someone who expressed their anti-war position on social networks and initiated criminal proceedings. The most important sin is human lives, and who understood that this was the most valuable sin? They naturally reacted sharply against the war. We, in turn, tried, of course, to speak out and disseminate information so people do not accept these summonses, do not go to military registration and enlistment offices, do not go to this war. This is not our war. This was the main slogan. This is not our war. They started spreading leaflets there. I remember some military registration and enlistment offices burned down. Two Russian party offices burned down. Most people, for example, from my environment, they just do not see the point and purpose of this war at all. So-called rail guerrillas operate in Bashkortostan. These are people who destabilized the railway transportation in order to disrupt the supply of weapons to the front. That is, they somehow obstructed trains. In small towns in Bashkortostan, leaflets began to appear at public transport stops, urging people to evade mobilization and go underground. However, by some indirect signs, we can say that a second wave of mobilization is likely to take place, because there are evidence. For example, they start to renew and compare their list of those subjected to conscription at military registration and enlistment offices. I think if only they would try to announce mobilization again. I think they will fail. And we can say that, well, Russia is going to have a hard time then. I expect a collapse at that very moment, when after they contracted conscripts who failed on the battlefield, they will once again try to mobilize Russians. There is such an opinion that if Putin says that something will not happen, then it will definitely happen. According to the latest census, which is not entirely correct, of course, after all, our peoples are not only Bashkais and Tatars, but also other nationalities. All of them have decreased in quantity. Our folks are shrinking, and now this war is simply destroying us. And it turns out that Putin is killing two birds with one stone, in the sense that he is destroying us, while trying to expand the Russian Empire towards Ukraine, towards Europe. He is the enemy. He kills two birds with one stone. First, he gets rid of indigenous peoples because he is sending them to death. This is nothing else but the total destruction of my fellow tribesmen. I said this at the beginning of the mobilization. More than 190 peoples live on the territory of the Russian Federation. Most of these peoples are indigenous nations who were enslaved and colonized at different times in their history. How did the Bashkirs become part of Russia after all? It is that myth about voluntary entry, and it has been promoted so intensively at schools, and that is it, what they are talking about all the time. But in fact, of course, there was no voluntary entry. The history of this process of conquest of Bashkortostan dates back to 1552, and almost to the end of the second third of the 18th century. That is more than two centuries. After the capture of Kazan in 1552, they slaughtered almost the entire male population. The colonialists and Muscovites continued their expansion into the Volga region and went on another conquest campaign, this time to the Bashkir lands. A small part of the Bashkir tribes did not resist the invaders and were forced to surrender to the colonizers. But most of the freedom-loving Bashkirs opposed Moscow's enslavement. 
The rulers of the Siberian Hanate, like Kuchum Khan and Kara Sakao, that is Sultan Gerai, fought almost until the middle of the 18th century, against Moscow and against the Russian Tsars, and many Bashkir families helped them in this. Part of the land was conquered, especially that part of the Bashkir lands and tribes who were part of the Siberian Hanate. Therefore, of course, it would be incorrect to talk about any voluntary entry. To control the occupied Bashkir lands in 1574, Moscovites were building the Ufa fortress in the order to pacify the warlike Bashkirs. During the first 50 years of occupation, the colonialists built 31 prison on the ancestral Bashkir lands. By the middle of the 16th century, Moscovites had surrounded their fortresses with four defensive lines, but this did not stop the Bashkirs, and they continued to fight for their freedom. Mm -hmm. We have been part of this empire as a colony for almost 500 years, and the Bashkirs have waged wars against Russia for more than 200 years and have raised numerous uprisings. These are called the Bashkira-Russian Wars. One of the very first occurred in the 1640s, when the city of Ufa was besieged. A prize was led by the Sheibainid and the Kuchum tribes, and the city barely resisted. Those days all of supply was carried out by rivers, and all of Moscow's expansion it has always been along rivers. Rivers were the communication and supply. There were successful uprisings when we really gained independence for 30 years or so, so we were able to win and for 30 years we were independent, but then the empire came again. The Bashkir's uprising against the Moscovite colonizers broke out quite regularly, about every 20 years, in 1640, 1662 and 1681. Then in 1704, 1735 and 1755, the Bashkirs rebelled against false baptism, the infringement of Islam and the seizure of their Bashkir lands by Moscow occupiers. In 1774, the Bashkirs, in pursuit of their national interests, joined the Pugachev uprising and again opposed Moscow imperialism. Some Bashkirs went over to Pugachev's side because Pugachev promised them freedom, including a freedom of belief. Pugachev fulfilled his promise to Bashkirs. All this is confirmed by historical facts. It was like to take your sovereignty as much as you can. And so Pugachev became surrounded by such powerful allies as Baimekov and Aswanov, Salavat Yulayev and others. In other words, it turned out that the Muslim Jihad, the Gazavat, has been announced and the whole of Bashkirkastan was rising against Russia. Back then the Tsarist government has lost the entire territory, with the exception of three fortresses only – Chelyabinsk, Ufa and Orenburg. It is precisely the fighters against the invaders of our lands that are Bashkir national heroes. The most striking example is Salavat Yulaev. In memory of the Bashkir people, Salavat Yulai will forever remain a hero who fought for the freedom of his people. Despite his young age, he led an army and led it against the Moscovite colonizers. After the suppression of the uprising, Tsarist officials tried to destroy everything related to Salavat Yulai, but the people preserved the memory of the glorious fighters for the freedom of the Bashkirs in the Republic of Bashkortostan. Salavat Yulai is a national hero. The streets of many cities are named after him and Bashkirs lay flowers and bronze statues. Since 1993, his image has adorned the coat of arms of the Republic of Bashkortostan. There are so many uprisings led by mullahs who opposed attacks to our religion. As for Moscow, Catherine II then formed the Spiritual Council of Muslims of Russia, where she appointed her loyal muftis, who underwent some special schooling and were extremely well paid. And they began to promote this topic, that we cannot resist the state's power, it has been given and laid upon us by Allah, and we need to practice patience and humility. At the same time, the same thing still happens when the spiritual council of Muslims in both Russia and Bashkirkastan is headed by people who faithfully serve this imperial government, who say yes, you should go to war. Although there are exactly the same Muslims living in Ukraine, and nowhere in any secret book of Quran it is said that you can seize foreign territories, kill their children, women, elderly. The Bashkirs never gave up the desire to gain their independence. After the abduction of Tsar Nicholas II and the collapse of the Russian Empire, the Bashkirs are again trying to take advantage of this historic opportunity and finally get rid of Moscow's oppression. 
The Bashkirs organized local governments and elected the Bashkir government. So the Bashkir government is being organized, which determines and holds elections, forms authorities and forms the armed forces immediately as early as June 1917. Of course, the Lenin Trotsky gang was not interested in such elections, and they organized the October armed coup. And amid the Russian turmoil, the Bashkir National Authority, Kurultai, declares independence of Bashkirkastan in December 17th. When our first Bashkir Republic was formed, led by Ahmed Zaki Validi in the 1917, we had our own army of about 15,000 soldiers and the entire artillery and all the proper regiments. So we fought against both the Whites and the Reds for our Republic's independence. And in October 1918 they quite happily welcomed Admiral Kauchak, who overthrew the directories and declared himself Supreme Commander-in-Chief of Russia. Then the Bashkirs sent him the embassy to negotiate self-governance. Bashkirs said, all right, you took Ufa, let's negotiate, Admiral Kauchak. But he was a supporter of a united and indivisible Russia and just shoot the Bashkir embassy. At that time, Vladimir Lenin and Trotsky, pushed from all sides, are sending their appeal to Muslim workers of the East. Take as much sovereignty as you can, they say that is freedom and so on within the borders of the Soviet Union. And an agreement was signed to establish the Bashkir Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic as part of the Soviets. This means full self-government, armed forces, own judiciary system and so on. I mean, take anything you can carry. But of course, the Soviet government also needed troops. And now the hastily formed, understaffed Bashkir units were created and quite dramatically going over the side of the Reds. Kauchak dissolved all national governments there, thereby alienating the Bashkir government with their 15 southern troops. And we were held in the front from Arenburg to Yekaterinburg. And this is the Euros. So we simply went over to the side of the Bolsheviks, who promised us to leave our republic and preserve our government. The monstrous famine did not spare the Bashkirs either. We had the same famine as you did in Ukraine, when the Bashkirs lost more than 700,000 people. But it was real genocide to lose many lives in two years. And who helped? We were helped by the American organization ARA. Walter Bay is famous in Bashkirkastan. Later the Bashkirs gave him the honorary title of citizen of Ufa and wanted to erect a monument. He helped us by opening thousands of canteens in Bashkiria in the Republic, where they fed our children. The famine of the 1920-21, it was horrific. How many people in my family have died? Every family was touched. This is all in order to the continuation of war, on the one hand, but mainly in order to form some goat reserves. During the Stalin period, the Bashkirs, like other indigenous peoples, fell under the heavy roller of brutal repressions. More than 12,000 Bashkirs were arrested some of whom were exiled to penitentiary camps, and some were just shot. Tens of thousands of Bashkirs were repressed in the 1930s. I even have repressed people in my family, and we suffered like any other nation that was part of the USSR. During the perestroika and the collapse of the Soviet Union, Bashkirs once again have a chance to gain their independence in 1990. The Supreme Soviet of the Bashkir Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic adopted the Declaration on the Sovereignty of Bashkortostan. In the 90s, Murtaza Rahimov, the first president of Bashkortostan, signed a declaration. We already have declarations and we already had independence by its tail. A declaration of sovereignty was adopted, an agreement was concluded on the distribution of management. In other words, as for civil rights and freedoms, this remains within the competence of the Federation, that is, law enforcement agencies. As for economic, social and cultural rights and freedoms, that is, the financial and economic part of governance, and so on remains under the jurisdiction of our regions. But when Yeltsin did become president, all his campaign promises to representative bodies, including the Supreme Soviet, not to mention the Bashkirs, ended with the shooting of the Supreme Soviet.
Три раза подписывали договора различные. We have signed three times various agreements in history with this state, which in one form or another, first with the Moscow Kingdom, then with the Bolsheviks, then with the Russian Federation, with Yeltsin, and three times Moscow unilaterally violated these agreements. Ушли, получается, вот, союзные республики. The Union Republics have left, and it was necessary, as it were, to reassemble the empire within the temporary borders of the RSFSR. This task has been solved by Putin, and from his first days, in fact, he began to work to restore imperial ruling, and gradually, step by step, accordingly. Rio Federale was limited, and the competence of powers of the regions were limited. После того, как в 91 году After the USSR collapsed in 1991, we acquired some kind of autonomy. We still have a lot of industrial facilities in our hands. But when Putin came, he also took them away. Moscow's attitude towards us, unfortunately, has always been very unfair and so colonial. The finishing touches were applied in 2010, when there was a Kurultai, which I also attended. There was an attempt to protect at least some remnants of federalism, but this did not work. Putin, uh, stole, uh... Putin began to reform the education system. In other words, he introduced a federal state standard, according to which only Russian was established as the language of education. Although before that we had schools in our republic, where all education activities were conducted only in our native language, Bashkir. If we talk about culture, all the same thing, culture is fully controlled. For example, we recently had an occasion when we staged a play, we had a story, such a moment when a woman was captured and forcibly baptized during an uprising and sold to serfs. She ran away from there and was caught, flogged and brought back. She was caught three times, and for the third time she was burned. They ordered it to burn her. This is the basis for this story. All this has been documented, and our Bashkir playwrights staged the play. So this performance was banned after the first show on a call from Moscow. Even our history, too, is fully controlled by Moscow, and it prevents us from telling the truth about our real history about our culture. You know, we were left as such a conventional tribe to dance, sing and entertain in our national costumes, those distinguished guests from Moscow. This is the only scene we have been left with. Five years ago, a bill was passed banning teaching our language in schools. And what does it mean to teach in schools? If you don't teach a language in your schools, then you can't keep the language in your family. Because what can you give in your family? In your family, you can only teach the kitchen language. But the language that is scientific and literary, it is taught only at school. Therefore, I believe that everything about Bashkir, Tata language and culture are being systematically destroyed. And now the most painful thing is this war, a physical destruction. We train specialists in the Bashkir language and we have research institutes there. But gradually, this Putin vertical of power, Putin's regime has brought everything to the north, all our efforts. We are in such a depressing state right now, and the only way I see how to restore and develop all this the main thing is not only to restore but also to develop is independence, no otherwise. And a history gives us a unique chance to really gain this independence. The full scale invasion of sovereign Ukraine by the Russian Federation on February 20, 2022, made the whole world shudder. Many countries have begun to think about their own security enter into new military alliances and review defense budgets. But certain processes have also begun to take place in the Russian Federation itself. Many opposition politicians, public figures, activists and representatives of different nations have begun to think about the security and future of their own people. Organizations such as League of Free Nations are emerging, as well as representatives of indigenous peoples who are part of the Russian Federation are organizing the Forum of Free Peoples of Post-Russia. I represent the Bashkir National Movement. I'm also a member of the League of Free Nations, which includes dozens of representatives of peoples colonized by the Russian Empire. And of course, I'm part of the two million Bashkir people, who, as I said, are now colonized by Moscow. All those gathered here are in favor 
of the collapse of Russia and the formation of new independent states on its territory. The Bashkir national movement, which I represent, is also fighting for the independence of Bashkortostan. Independence is a long-standing dream of the Bashkir people, which for more than 200 years have revolted and waged wars for their freedom against the Russian Empire. This is a truly historic event, as it was the first time that the Forum of Free Peoples of Post-Russia was held at a high international level in the European Parliament. This was such a significant event. I think the event which took place was very successful. This structure is beginning to become more serious and more elaborate. There were serious speeches, there were serious proposals, but what happened in such an iconic place as in the European Parliament speaks volumes. The reaction of the Russian authorities already shows that they take this thing as very serious and that this problem exists for them. And most likely I think they are very afraid of this real collapse of Russia, which we are trying to make a reality. In December 2022, the Bashkir National Political Center, led by Ruslan Gabasov, appealed to the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine with an initiative to recognize the state sovereignty of the Republic of Bashkortostan. The initiator of the registration of the bill in the Verkhovna Rada was the Ukraine's parliament member Oleg Dunda, who also took part in the post-Russia forum of free peoples. The Tatarstan, the Kalmykia, the Karelia. In the 1990s, Bashkortostan voted for its independence. But then the Western world and Western democracies were blind to this process. Accordingly, we must return to this issue and recognize that they are already Tatars and the Bashkiris have already decided on their sovereignty. We just need to support them and recognize them as independent state and give them this opportunity. I believe that we should undoubtedly be free from Russia, especially in today's realities. The opinion that we should be independent is already indisputable, because we have seen the suffering of our people for 500 years already. I don't want the same thing for my kids and for my grandkids. We want to be really independent now, to build our own state and be there. We have everything we need to be like Dubai and build absolutely good, peaceful, neighborly relations with all our neighbors, pursue our own policy and open our own embassies in other countries and in Ukraine too. And it's normal to just be human human people, build our own state and develop it so that we have a future like the Bashkirs. It includes language, culture, tradition, everything, everything at all for future generations. We still want to create our own Bashkir army under the supervision of experienced career officers, because we understand that today I personally believe that we still have to liberate the Republic by the means of our military. The repression will continue unless a revolution begins from within, and in this case, Russia will fall apart. Of course, our national movement has always been strong among Bashkiria. In the Republic itself, it went underground, and of course, we keep in touch with them. I'm telling you, we're all waiting for a day X, when this empire collapses and we can operate openly. Therefore, even if one great day Putin croaks, Russia collapses, Bashkortostan will not gain independence peacefully. I believe that sooner or later Russia will lose anyway. Ukraine will win and after Russia is defeated, its army will be defeated and enter Russian territory and finish it off and liberate our republics. The war against Ukraine was the trigger for the fact that such movements began to appear not only in Bashkortostan but also in Tatarstan, Chechnya, for example in the Finno-Ugric region. Even Russians who live in Siberia do not want to endlessly send their money, which they earn from oil and gas, to Moscow. And they've even begun to wake up to realize that after the collapse of Russia, they might live much better than they are now. I would say to my compatriots who are threatened with mobilization, do not take summonses in your hands, you'd better go to jail. But if you are already on the battlefield, don't fight, it's better to surrender. I think we should save our lives, there is no need to die heroically for Putin's useless cause. Dear Bashkirs, 
Bashkorts. We are all waiting for a second wave of mobilization. Undoubtedly, it will happen, because Russia is not going to stop this war. And we can see, it fights not by skill, but by numbers, and as always, it throws corpses and cannon fodder at the front line. We, the Bashkirs, there are not so many of us. Ukrainians did nothing wrong to us. Ukrainians live several thousand kilometers away from us. And we have no cultural or mental contact at all, whatsoever. Why should we, Bashkirs, fight for the Russian world, which has been destroying us, suppressing and trying to assimilate us all the time? Why should we fight for them and drive thousands of miles away to kill people who did nothing wrong to us? This is not our war.